poetic naturalism is a combination of two things. Naturalism and poeticness, okay? So naturalism is an old idea. It's basically the idea that the universe, all of reality, is just one thing. It's the natural world. There's no separate supernatural world. It's just the stuff that we know about, obeying the laws of nature, whatever they may be, laws that we can discover by doing science. The poetic part says that even though there's only one world, the natural world, there are many ways of talking about that world. So sometimes we want to be particle physicists, right? We want to talk about electrons and protons obeying Schrodinger's equation of quantum mechanics. Other times we might want to be biologists, right? We talk about organisms and evolution and so forth. Other times we want to be human beings. We want to talk about values and we want to talk about why we act in certain ways rather than other ways. And these all need to fit together. That's the poetic part of it, that there's different stories we can tell about the universe, some of which are just science stories, but some of which are very human stories. I think that our natural human way of talking about the world is multifaceted by its very nature, right? We talk about stuff doing things, you know, the scientific part of the world, and we talk about the human part of the world, morals, values, meaningfulness, and stuff like that. And there is a temptation, let me say, when you become more knowledgeable about the scientific sides of things, to eliminate the other side of things. There's an, an, indeed, there's a whole idea called eliminativism, where you take something like morality or consciousness and say it doesn't exist, right? And I think that's a mistake, because it's not that it doesn't exist, it's that it's explained by and emergent from these other layers, these other ways of talking about reality. So it's, it's somewhere, poetic naturalism is somewhere in between. It's in between uh, a view that says there are many different aspects to reality, they're fundamentally different from each other, and a view that says there's only one reality, we should only ever do science. This is saying there's only one reality, but there's many ways of talking about that reality that map onto the different w ways we have of thinking about the world. You know, I'm a physicist, so I think about the most fundamental layer of reality. And physicists can get a little cocky in thinking about the world, right? Mm -hmm. Physics is hard, there's a lot of math involved, and we tend to think that if you can do physics, you can do anything, you can figure out any problem. I've always been resistant to that temptation, but nevertheless, I would sometimes give into it. So when I was young, I thought, like many physicists still think, that you could sort of derive morality or meaningfulness from the fundamental laws of nature. And then by becoming better trained in philosophy, I realized that wasn't really true, that I was cheating my way to the answer to the problem. But I didn't want to give up entirely, and so I think that the happy meeting ground is accepting that some choices that we make about the world, about how to talk about the world, are human choices, or choices that are up to us. They're not fixed by the universe. What we decide right versus wrong is not something that we go out and measure experimentally. Right? So I don't think it was any one discovery or one piece of scientific advance. I just think it's a, it's a nice reconciliation between what we know about science and what we know about philosophy. You know, time is one of the most obvious, important things about the universe that we know about, right? There's space where things are located, and there's time that flows on, and all the stuff around us in the universe happens over and over again, and that's time. One of the things that is most obvious about time is that the past and future are different. Right? We think of the past as fixed. It's in the books. It's already happened. The future is up for grabs. Right? We can make choices about what had happened in the future. It wasn't until long after philosophy and science began that we realized that the laws of physics, from Isaac Newton to the present day, don't distinguish between the past and future. They treat them exactly the same. So why is it that our everyday lives have past and future being very, very different? That's the arrow of time problem. And we basically know the answer. It has to do with entropy, this idea of disorderliness of a physical system. Systems tend to start out very orderly and become more disorderly over time. There's a whole long discussion to have about why that helps us remember the past and not the future and so forth. But cosmologists, people who study the universe as a whole, would like to understand why the universe began with such low entropy. Near the Big Bang, our universe was remarkably orderly compared to how messy it could have been. And that set the stage for all of the differences between past and future for the last 14 billion years, but we don't know what it was that set the stage in exactly that way. I think that broadly speaking, cosmology is a subset of physics. You know, physics will study both the very small and the very large. Cosmology studies the whole universe all at once. Most of physics takes the universe apart and looks at it piece by piece. But here's a very, 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 very nice thing. When you look at the universe in really tiny pieces, it becomes simpler 
right? An electron is far simpler than a frog or a sheep or a constitutional government. But when the, you look at the universe on the largest scales or at the earliest times, it also looks simpler again. So the universe looks complicated in between scales, on human size scales or, you know, between a millimeter and a light year. That's where the universe looks complicated. But there's this fundamental simplicity that you get in the very small and the very large, the very, very early and the very late in the universe. I've had a great time. I love the idea of bringing together philosophy and science and all sorts of other ideas, right? I think that we artificially put up barriers between these, in academia especially. There's no reason why those barriers need to be preserved when we go to a more public kind of event. You know, I think that it's largely what I expected or maybe what I hoped for, let's put it that way. But, you know, as I was saying this morning at my first event, early in the morning on a drizzly English morning, uh, Saturday, people waking up and coming through the countryside to f talk about cosmology in the beginning of the universe. And that just warms my heart. That just makes me feel really good about human humanity generally. How the Light Gets In is the Institute of Art and Ideas unique festival, combining days full of talks and debates in philosophy, politics, arts and science, with evenings full of music and dance. Get your ticket now at howthelightgetsin.org.